Okay, thank you very much everyone for the time to spend with you today. Uh, yeah, indeed, I do have quite the story to share and I'm just so happy and, uh, and glad to still be around to be able to share my story. Uh, Dr. Youssef and Dr. Hayes, uh, the three of us have been almost the three amigos getting through this the last four years. And I tell you, we've got such a bond now that has grown between us as we're all, thank you, as we're all making sure we get me back to complete health and back to my usual activities I used to do on a daily basis. Um, as, as Dr. Youssef mentioned, I, I've been a professional athlete for about 20 years, a collegiate athlete and high school athlete for years before that. And so athletics and sports, fitness was my, was my life. Uh, running, jumping, playing day after day, twice a day a lot of times. Uh, I did that from my teen years all the way up until about my mid-50s. Uh, even uh, maybe about six months before this incident happened to me, I was still jogging three days a week downtown Seattle with a, a running partner friend of mine. You know, we'd go about three miles each time and he's 20 years younger, you know, but I was still keeping up with him pretty well. And then I noticed, you know, in those two or three months before my big incident happened, uh, New Year's Day 2015, I started feeling like I was slowing down a little bit. You know, I thought, ah, it's my extra 15 pounds I'm carrying, you know, I can't run as fast as I used to or, I have the endurance that he does. He's 20 years younger than I am. And so I noticed I was starting to slow down a little bit. I didn't think anything of it. I'd come back from my runs, huffing and puffing a little bit more than usual. You know, but after I calmed down, I'm back to doing what I do and get my day started. Uh, I remember having my annual physical exam a couple weeks before this incident. Uh, Dr. William Wu over at uh, Swedish and Ballard He's retired now, but he was my family physician for quite a few years. And he passed me as he did every year with flying colors with my annual physical. And you know, we're both jumping up and down, great cholesterol, great uh, blood pressure, great diet, great everything, doing all the right things. Uh, two weeks later, I'm out trying to play around the golf with some friends of mine. And we made it through that day. That was January 2nd, and this incident happened on January 3rd, 2015. January 2nd, after watching a day of uh, New Year's Eve uh, and New Year's Day football games, I'm out uh, playing golf with some friends of mine. And, um, you know, we made it through all 18 holes, but I noticed at the end of that round of golf, uh, my back was excruciatingly painful and sore for some reason. I thought I just had a tight muscle or something, so, I went on back home and laid down and actually laid down on a ice pack or a gel pack uh, for an hour or so and just let it chill and cool and get the inflammation out of there like I'd always done with athletic injuries over the years. January 3rd, we came back the next morning, the same group of guys to play golf again. And we were just getting started. We we're on the first hole getting ready to tee off and I told the guys, I said, you know, I don't feel quite right today. My back is killing me. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm nauseous, I'm sweating. We just walked up to the first tee and I, and I told the guys, I said, hey, I think I'm gonna go and see, see Dr. Wu, see my doctor and see what's going on with me. I was actually a little ticked off because I just passed my physical with flying colors. And so I wanna go see what Dr. Wu has to say about all of this. I get in my car and I drive over to Swedish uh, Hospital in Ballard. And I remember, I don't even remember even getting behind my wheel of my car, but, Somehow, I drove myself there. I don't know, remember parking, I don't remember a lot of things. I do remember getting to his office and barely seeing the reception desk in his office and everything went black. Everything went black. Uh, I don't remember anything from then on until I woke up a couple weeks later. Uh, they threw me in the ambulance, emergency open heart surgery, 11 and a half hours or so. Uh, that saved my life. And um, it was just the miracle of miracles. One, to not go home that day and lay on an ice bag again, because I probably would never have gotten up from that. Uh, two, to get to my doctor's office so they can do a quick diagnosis of what's going on. Three, to throw me in the ambulance. And four, for these great doctors to be ready at the ready with their team to take care of me right away. Uh, I woke up 
two weeks later. Uh, Dr. Youssef says he put me in a medically induced coma for five or six days. Uh, my life was kind of hanging between life and death on that little line for quite a few of those days and even coming out of that. And I remember when I did finally start coming to my senses, two, three weeks later, I was heavily medicated, of course, uh, I didn't remember much of what had gone on. I knew that the last remembrance I had was seeing my doctor's office reception desk, and then here I am in ICU at Swedish here on Cherry Hill, where I stayed for about two months or so. Uh, it was a battle. It was very, very serious. Uh, you know, we, through a lot of, you know, good graces uh, and blessings, made it through. Uh, I was discharged a couple, week, a couple months later to um, Kindred Hospital for a couple of weeks to rehab and get back on my feet again. My, my legs felt like they weighed 400 pounds a piece. I could barely stand up. I could barely move them. They just weren't working from, from laying flat on my back for two months. Um, and then after that, so here we are about oh, mid-March or so, I'm finally allowed to go home. And I essentially took it easy, laid on my back as much as possible for the next four, five, six months, all the way through the summer of 2015. And I was out of action. I just couldn't do much. I couldn't sit up long. Uh, I was still in pain from having my breastbone cut open and, and all the things that they do with you. Um, it was an ordeal. Um, so we made it through 2015. March 2016, we came back and did a descending aortic graft that they put in, uh, which was the second part of the surgery. Uh, and again, that was uh, had quite an ordeal to get through as well. But I knew I had to get through these things, you know, and I'm kind of a strong guy, full of fortitude and go get them and, you know, very goal oriented. So once we had our goals in place with the doctors of what we needed to do and what we had to do, uh, I was all for it. As long as my health stayed good, uh, I felt I was going to get through it. Now I want to take you back to when I came out of uh, my, my coma and my couple weeks of unconsciousness. Uh, a few days after that, I had one of those one of those experiences they talk about where you are kind of going towards the light, you know. Uh, people who are on the verge of dying talk about this light that they see that they're going towards. And I was sitting in my hospital bed, uh, a vision of me sitting there, and uh, I had a vision of God up above me, looking over me, over my shoulder. And I'm leafing through this big picture book, big huge pictures of all the things I'd done in my life up to this point. My friends, my growing up years, my college years, uh, activities all around town. And I was flipping through this thing and I'm about, you know, a little more than halfway through and I turned the page and it was totally blank. And at that point, I knew I was a goner. I, I knew I had died and was going to be called home at that point. I heard a voice tell me, James, have faith. Turn the other page. Turn the other page. And that was hard to do. I had to summon some strength to do that because I was scared. I, I didn't know what the next page was going to show me. And I eventually reached over to the corner and turned the page and it too was blank. And now I'm really scared. You know, I'm thinking God's playing tricks on me. <laughs> and, and I can just hear God say, hey James, foolish man, fool, you're so foolish. Have faith. I told you to turn the other page. And I followed one more time those instructions. And I turned the page and at first it was blank, it was a black page, but then some faint images started reappearing on the page of photographs and images of me and my life and my loved ones and people who had been with me throughout. 
And they became more and more real, more and more vibrant. Uh, and all of a sudden were full-fledged color photos. And I knew at that point I was gonna be okay. I knew that I would crossed that point. I wasn't gonna go all the way towards the light and whatever happens at that point happens. I, I knew I was gonna stay here. Uh, a lot of folks say God still had work for me to do. I said, well, okay, I'm still waiting to see what that work is. I think he's starting to unveil it uh, slowly but surely to me. But at that point, I knew I would be okay. And that's where I say I had the faith to hang in there, to listen to that little voice to tell me to keep on keeping on, keep turning the page, don't stop. And I went through that experience, and it's just as real as it was yesterday, and it's almost four years ago, January would be four years. After making it through 2015, and of course with all the periodic doctor checkups, the cardiologists I have, uh, Dr. Castorello is my cardiologist, and a whole team of doctors here at Swedish, uh, we all kept on working to put me back together to have me do the exams and tests that I needed to do. Um, I started feeling about 2016 or so that I was no longer the great athletic specimen I had always been. I couldn't, I couldn't walk too far, you know, three or four blocks around the neighborhood, I was exhausted. I couldn't go up and down two flights of stairs without taking a break. Uh, this was far, far from what I had always been all my life. I used to just run and jump and, and be the strongest guy in the NBA for years and years. And, and endurance, I'd play all 48 minutes of games back to back to back to back. The coach would just say, oh, just leave James out there. He's, he's not tired. And I wasn't. I was just running and had great stamina. Uh, I used to poke fun at the guys I was playing against who were hanging over and grabbing their shorts because they're so tired, they can't, they're breathing and huffing and puffing. And I, I would just not let them see that with me. So I'd play 48 minutes every game, game after game. And so it started playing on me mentally that, hmm, I'm wondering if I'm ever gonna get back to doing what I used to do. Would I be able to jog a mile again? Uh, will I be able to lift weights? You know, uh, I was big, strong, 100 pound dumbbells in each arm and doing all these kind of things. Dr. Youssef tells me now I shouldn't do those and I don't <laughs> because I don't want to spike my blood pressure. Um, so now I'm doing, you know, 20 pounds. Okay, you know, everybody's laughing and looking at me and the ladies are coming by doing 20 pounds too. And I say, hey, you guys just don't understand. I've been there, so. <laughs> I don't need to show off anymore. So that started playing on me mentally. And mentally, I started, started feeling a sense of um, longingness for what I used to be, a sense of depression even, of feeling that, wow, this, this, is, not, this is not the old me I remember going to the gym every day at 6 a.m. and getting a two-hour workout in and running three days a week, uh, three miles each time. It, I couldn't do any of those things. Um, and then 2017 came along, and I'm still under this distress and this wondering about my future. How, am I physically ever gonna get back to what I used to be? Um, and in 2017, I'm starting to have some business challenges with my long-running uh, outpatient physical therapy clinic business I had for almost 30 years, the Donaldson Clinic. Uh, fi I finally had to close it down. I mean, I was throwing all my life savings into it to keep it going. Uh, of course, you guys know insurance reimbursements keep going down and expenses keep going up and the margins keep getting slimmer. And so I was just, a business person trying to keep my business going and threw my life savings into it to try to save it and eventually couldn't save it and had to put it out of business. Um, a long-standing personal relationship I had uh, with a wonderful woman, uh, my wife. Uh, she uh, was a, uh, a recent um, immigrant from China China, China nationalist. I did a lot of work in China for the last several years. And she came over to Seattle. Um, I helped her get settled, helped her to get her 
a nice job downtown Seattle, you know, get the car together, transportation, all those things, life insurance, uh, investment things, health insurance. And then when she finally got to the point where she got her U.S. citizenship and her green card, she left the marriage, just left. I was out of town for a weekend, and I came back, and she was gone. Uh, her little 10-year-old boy was gone. And I, it hit me. It hit me hard. I was coming home for the rest of the year, each day to a big old empty house without the sound of laughter of kids or her, uh, you know, cooking up a great meal, dinners and lunches she used to do every day, uh, going to bed every night alone, uh, waking up alone. All those things were really starting to weigh on me heavily. And, and it's, this is the mental aspect of physically I'm recovering and I'm feeling better and I'm starting to get back to my old self, but mentally I am really starting to fall apart. Uh, the IRS was after me and made a huge determination of hundreds of thousands of dollars that I'm going to owe them the rest of my life. Um, and we're fighting that now, pushing back on that. Uh, you know, looking at declaring bankruptcy to save my house and the other few assets I still have. And all these things were weighing me down so much in 2017. By the time November rolled around 2017, almost a year ago, I found myself not sleeping through the night anymore. Uh, I'd wake up at 1.30 or 2 in the morning, and my mind's racing 100 miles an hour, one, trying to figure out how to save my business, trying to figure out what happened to my marriage, trying to, trying to figure out the IRS, trying to figure out my health at 1.30 in the morning, and I couldn't get back to sleep. Uh, this went on for four or five nights in a row at least, and, and I, I took a look at myself and I said, James, this is not you. Something is definitely wrong. Uh, I reached out to my family uh, physician over at Swedish Ballard, and I told him about it. I had an appointment to go in and see him. I thought he was just gonna prescribe a, slim, a simple sleeping pill for me to get me through the night. I went over all my stresses I was under in 2017, and, and he said, James, you are under a great deal of stress, you have anxiety, you have depression, and you have suicidal thoughts and tendencies. And he, did, and, I was, and he was right. I mean, there were days from Thanksgiving last year to, to Christmas of last year where I really didn't think I was going to make it through the day. I already had it planned out, how I was going to end my life. Uh, you know, a big coil of rope hanging up in my, in my garage. And every day I'd come home and open up my garage door and I'd look up there and see that coil of rope and see the rafters and, and some days envision myself just hanging there. And those are scary times to go through. I don't know how much of this is related to my near-death experience I had with my open heart surgery and how much isn't. I know there's studies going on to tie these things together, the physical and the emotional part of all what we go through. I finally was starting to make some progress through that depression and anxiety. December 2017, January 2018, a young student athlete over at Washington State University, my alma mater, got a gun, put it to his head, and killed himself. Suicide. He was, he was the heir apparent to be the starting quarterback for this year's Cougar football team killed himself five days after he was on a family vacation with his family in Mexico. And they all said he was fine, he looked great, he was laughing, joking. He went back to Pullman, took a gun unbeknownst to his friend, took it back to his apartment and killed himself. That was mid-January 2018. I woke up the next day and stories were all over the place about Tyler Helensky was uh, the young fellow's name about Tyler, and the newspapers are trying to tell his stories, the sports reporters are trying to tell his story, his family's trying to tell his story, and at that instant, and I'm still in the depths of my despair, but at that instant, it, I just got shook to the core of, wow, everybody's out there trying to tell Tyler's story. 
I have to make it through what I'm going through so I can stay here and tell my story. I didn't want all my friends out there telling versions of my story, which, you know, could be as inaccurate as who knows what or made up or what have you. Let me tell my story. And that's what really shook me to the point of saying, okay, we've got to get out of this depression. We've got to get to the bright side of things again. And I kept plugging away. My, my doctor had put me on anti-anxiety medication, anti-depression medication, uh, which helped. He provided some counseling for me, which helped. Uh, I put together a small group of intimate friends, uh, six or eight of them, and I asked them all, hey, at 1.30 in the morning, if I need to call somebody, can I call you? And they all agreed and said, definitely. Put me on your speed dial. Call me. And I said, but I need you guys to call me too, you know, two or three times a week. Just check in on me and see how I'm doing. Uh, what's weighing on me today? Is it my health? Is it my finances? Is it my life? Ask me and, and let me have a discussion with you. A lot of times we ask people how they're doing and they, you know, they give a little quick nod and say, I'm doing fine, and just brush it off. And it never goes below the surface. To talk to people who are dealing with these kind of anxieties and these kind of depressions and suicidal thoughts, you have to get below the surface and talk with them. I've shared my stories both with Dr. Youssef and Dr. Hayes. Uh, they know, they've seen it with their patients. Uh, you know, they've had some personal experiences with it themselves. And, you know, this is our team that we've put together to ensure that we keep on getting and improving and ensuring that there's decades more of life to live. Now I feel like I understand why, why the good Lord kept me here. Uh, after Helensky's suicide, I became all of a sudden a voice and an advocate for mental health awareness and suicide prevention, especially amongst our, our young students. We have two, two school-aged children a day in the state of Washington that kill themselves, two a day. And these are eight-year-olds all the way to 18. And for the life of me, I can't figure out what an eight-year-old would be so despondent about but they go through bullying, they go through trying to be accepted, they go through not feeling loved, they go through not fitting in, all kinds of things, and those things are traumatizing to young kids. And so that is the reason I feel I am still here. My next chapter that I'm creating now will be putting together a nonprofit foundation that will give me a platform that I can go around the country and speak to student groups, uh, student athletes, athletic teams, uh, businesses, corporations, whoever wants to hear the story uh, and share that there is hope. There is hope. Uh, we can't give up on ourselves and fortunately, hopefully, we have friends around us who don't give up on us either. And that really has gotten me to the point of where I am now. Uh, I have a future now. I have opportunities ahead of me. I remember when I was in the midst of all this, uh, my family physician over at Swedish Ballard sitting two feet away from me. And he's urging me and begging me, he said, James, don't, don't take your life. There are so many people who are gonna miss you. There are so many people who love you. There are so many people who care about you. And I looked right back at him and I said, Doc, nobody's gonna miss me. <coughs> Nobody loves me and nobody cares about me. That's how I felt in the midst of that darkness. You can't see, you can't feel, you can't, you can't sense hardly anything. But I'm so glad that I hung in there and I'm so glad now that I realize that the thousands of people I've touched throughout my life would be affected if I left this earth on my own doing. I've created a social media community of hundreds and hundreds of folks that follow me and share their stories with me. Um, and I realize now that my message is getting out there to them, that it's okay to talk about these kind of things we go through. It's okay to share. Uh, my real focus of my passion is trying to get 
boys and young men and men to speak, to open up, to reach out and ask for help. You know, being a big time competitive athlete, hey, I never showed anybody I was hurt, I was injured, I was tired. You wouldn't see me limping around out there because that's vulnerability. And we just don't show those things. You know, I've got old broken fingers on my hand from playing basketball. The trainer would just snap them back in place, put some tape on it, and I go play again. You don't cry. See, this is the life of boys and men so many times, especially competitive athletes. And we have to get our boys and our men to say, hey, I've got a problem. Let me talk to you. Uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me share with you what I'm feeling today. Uh, and there's a huge world out there of tens of millions of people a day in our country going through the exact same thing of despair and, and lack of hope. This is the difference I, I hope to make in their lives by sharing my story and letting them see that if they just hang in there a little bit longer, there is a tomorrow. And they'll be glad that they hung in there to see those glorious tomorrows that will keep on coming their way. I wanted to share that with you guys because I know I'm here to speak about my aortic dissection and all the rest of these things. Uh, I think I was, every one of those images was me, wasn't it, Doc? <laughs> I mean, I, I, had, I had all those things. But that was the physical part of things, and that's getting better. Now I'm back in the gym a couple of days a week. Not five days a week, but a couple of days a week. You know, 45 minutes, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I, I leave, but I feel so much better getting in, a, in that environment again. I'm around other people who are fitness-minded and positive and working on their own, their own health, their own bodies. So that's a good environment for me to be in two or three days a week that I can get there. I'm feeling stronger, I'm feeling more stable, I'm walking further, adding on another block or two every week or two, and now I can walk without feeling like I'm carrying a piano on my back. Uh, it's coming back. I even tried to jog the other, the other day with my dog. I only made it about 10 yards. But uh, that was a start, to be able to pick him up and put him down again for 30 feet, and then I stopped. I said, oh, that, that's what it used to feel like, you know? So that's what I'm working on, to push myself to get back to those points. Don't know if I ever run three miles again. Uh, don't know if I ever play a basketball game again, but to have good health, both physically and mentally, is what I am aiming for and what it's all about for me at this point. I thank the great doctors, the great team, the great staffs here at, at Swedish that, like Humpty Dumpty, put me all together again. You know, and I had three big operations uh, and we're still contemplating maybe another one, one of these days. Um, but things are looking bright and better. So I'm excited about life now. Uh, I know that I can remake myself again, as I've done several times throughout my working career. I know that I've got a great message to share with our young people, especially with our boys and with our men, even more so. And I just wanna be that voice and that advocate for mental health awareness, uh, suicide prevention, and also letting people be instilled with that spirit of, yes, you can, I can do it. I can overcome these obstacles in life. None of us were promised a life full of, or free of, uh, you know, all kind of difficulties and challenges. Uh, I, I think uh, one of my articles I had written about me, I was talking about my, my 91 year old pastor who just finally just passed away uh, a few months ago. And he used to remind us at church uh, over the years, he's been there for about 40 years, that if you think you don't have any challenges and you've gotten by issue free so far in life, just keep on living, just keep on living. And even if old age is the only thing that gets you at the end, like it got him, he was dependent on other folks for 24 seven care, keep on living. <coughs> Life is gonna present its challenges and it's really up to you and us and those folks that you bring around you to help you get through those things. So with that, Doc, I wanna say thank you so much for inviting me out. Uh, Dr. Hayes, great to see you. 
Uh, if we have a moment for questions or anything, you Absolutely. want to allow that? Okay. So I'm going to have the opportunity to let's have anybody who has questions for Mr. Johnson to ask them now, and then we're going to break for our lab and lunch, and then we we'll do our panel discussion on the surgical aspect of it. Great. Kind of in the afternoon, maybe in place of one of the presentations, just mm -hmm. so we can catch up. Yeah, any questions offhand, anybody, before we wrap up? Yes. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming up here, especially to share your physical and then emotional, mentally, um, thank you. journey. Um, I just want to encourage you that, you know, last year, St. Joseph Covenant, they give opportunity for staff to be trained as a mental health uh, uh, I, I was wondering about volunteer, volunteer my time, travel, hotel, everything go down the road by being trained. Good. And just so you know, now at this moment, about 1.6 million first aider in America. That's right. So that is a, a great news. And um, and I just think, think about, we take average 10 years, million years, yes. for a patient or people have mental health get diagnosed. Mm -hmm. I mean, Yes. And then people have physical illness, you go right away. Yeah. But then we know the both are praying for vaccination, both yeah. immediate balance, because our emotion, yeah. risk blood pressure, uh, and other, other side effects might compromise our physical health. Yes. So I want just want to thank you. Thank we need you. somebody like you. Thank and you. And more people able thank to you. tackle both mental health. Thank so you. We can have a better emotion, emotional balance. Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well, <laughs> unlike, unlike our physical being, uh, you know, when I had an uh, injured knee playing basketball, I'd limp around a little bit out there and everybody can tell uh, something's wrong with me. I might put a wrap on it or whatever. But emotionally and mentally, people can't see, they can't see inside. And we're all taught to put on our little public face and smile when it's appropriate and, you know, get through our day. Uh, not really complain unless you really have somebody you can feel confident in talking to about those kind of things. Uh, public, public people especially, you know, public uh, profile folks, uh, TV and entertainers and sports stars, all of us learn how to put our little smile on. And, you know, all these things I post on Facebook and I'm always smiling, looking great, and people are saying, wow, James, it's great to see you out and great to see you smiling. I, I usually get back to them and say, but inside, I'm still, I'm still dealing, I'm still challenging, I'm still pushing myself to get back to where I need to be. So it's up to us really to reach out, to help, uh, to ask for help um, when it's on the emotional side of things, yes. James, I'll ask you a question. After you came in with your dissection, you went through the treatment, and those first couple of years when you're getting your physical back, yeah. Was that the main focus and that drive and everything was just to get rehabilitated? And then once you got kind of rehabilitated, is that when the mental part started heading in? Like, were you distracted yeah. by the physical recovery to the mental? The concept that you had an aortic dissection or you had this yeah. catastrophic thing living in you, mm -hmm. did that have an impact on you mentally? Yeah, good question. You know, I, I never really realized how bad off I was. <laughs> you know, I still don't quite realize the severity of what I went through. Uh, you know, Yusuf tells me once in a while, Dr. Hayes tells me, and uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, 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 it could have been worse, I guess. I, I wouldn't be here. Uh, but I did know that I wasn't quite my old self, physically. I, I just couldn't do what I used to do, and that bothered me. It still bothers me. Uh, and when I was carrying that along with me, and then compounding on top of that all the life's happenings, you know, the business failure, the divorce, uh, you know, all kind of things. Those are big life happenings that handling one is okay, maybe two. Handling four or five on top of medical issues is almost too much for anybody. And that's really uh, what I've dealt with. Now I'm well on the other side of all of that, uh, of that dark place I was in when I was talking with my family physician and telling him that nobody cared, nobody's gonna miss me. I'm well on the other side of that. Uh, but still, I have those days where it's just, it, you just, you just start questioning yourself again. 
Uh, and when that happens, I make sure I get out of the house. I make sure I go visit and see somebody who I can talk with and share, uh, enjoy some time with. And that always has a way of lifting me up. Uh, I'm getting involved with, uh, you know, Children's Hospital. I got a couple of my friends here from Children's and going by to see uh, the children at the hospital and working on the cancer prevention programs they do over there is really uplifting kind of work. So I think by giving back, by speaking about it, speaking in itself is therapeutic for me. Sharing it on Facebook and social media is very therapeutic for me. These are the things that I'm encouraging everybody to do. Yes. Um, oh, it does. Um, I'm Peter Byers. I'm a medical geneticist at the University of Washington, and I take care of people who have rare conditions. And a number of them lead to aortic dissection and vascular rupture and things of that sort. Yeah. One of the things that's really striking about this group is that for some of the people with quite rare disorders, they've never met anybody else who has the same condition. Mm -hmm. And uh, we had the experience this last summer of bringing together uh, a group of, it was about 40 or 50 people, half of whom were affected, others were family members. And it was striking because for about half or three quarters of the group, it was the first time that they'd encountered anybody mm. that, had, that had the same thing. We were starting, planned to start our program at about nine o'clock in the morning and people were still wandering in. Mm. There were people in the room and there was this buzz that started. Mm. I mean, it just sort of, it, it started quietly and then kept yeah. on going. And it was just, everybody was talking to each other and people were, they didn't have to deal with the, oh, I've got this rare genetic disorder. I don't think I can really tell you. I can't pronounce the name of it. Okay. I, all of those kinds of things. Sure. They got beyond that because then all the other is aspects of how they lived their lives, what they did, mm. uh, came to the fore and it was just, going. At 9.20, we said, you've got to stop for a few uh, minutes. We need to talk to you about what we want to talk about. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we went on and, you know, yeah. at 11 o'clock, one of the women stood up and said, listen, you got to stop. Um, we have things that we need to talk about. We want to go back to doing it. So we wow. broke and, and the same thing happened again. Yeah. And one of the things that struck us and has done so with all the people who, like you, have had aortic surgery, yeah. is that often you've never met anybody who's had the same thing. That's right. There's no opportunity, there's no shared vocabulary that you have. Nobody understands what it means to get your chest cut open yes. and, and to have all of those kinds of things. And we're in the process now, and I hope we can do it in, in you know, cooperation with people here as well mm. at the university, of building programs where we have, um, we get people together who are in this. Good. And these peer groups, which have <clears throat> been a common portion, Good. a common aspect of rare conditions, because mm. it's hard to get people together. But for more common features like this, yeah, sure. it doesn't mean, it doesn't save you from bankruptcy, it doesn't save right. you from your wife disappearing, right. it doesn't save yeah, you from all of those other kinds of things, right. but it gives you a venue in which to talk about it, mm. even if this is not what you've done before, and we have plenty of people for whom they can't talk, they can't, they don't talk about it. Wow, wow. So it's, it, I would love to get to see you, yeah. you know, you have a common voice, you have, a large voice yeah. in, in the uh, you know in the community for that sort of thing, mm -hmm. and getting you involved just to add a little bit to your stresses and to add a little ah, bit more no, to your duties. A, and things. A, a, but it would be wonderful to see yeah. you involved with that because you have the ability to share the share the uh, the experiences. I would love to, Doc. Thank you. Thank you. Matter of fact, Dr. Youssef and I made the rounds of uh, a patient uh, floor that he uh -huh. had three or four patients uh, at yeah. the same time that were going through a similar thing yeah. I was going through. Yeah. I was just two or three weeks ahead of them, but I'm up on my feet walking uh -huh. and <laughs> going room to room and saying, hey, you guys can get there too. Right. You, you can know? Get up. So I, I would love to yeah. uh, do whatever I can to continue to inform and enlighten folks, working with the doctors, and uh, anything else you put together in that regard would be great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. When I first when I first met James and he became one of my patients, I said, James, you know, I think I could dunk on you. And you know what he did? He looked at me and he said, 
not on your life. Uh, that's right. That's right. No, there's no way. <laughs> no way. He said, that's not going to happen. <laughs> even, even in my current condition. No, it's not, that is not going to happen. <laughs> Wow. Well, this has been great, guys. Uh, thank you so much. I'll let you take your break for lunch and whatever else you're going to do. And I just want to say thank you so much. And stick around, James. I'm sure some people would yeah, like to talk. Yeah, I would love to. Yeah, we can do that. Sure, that'd be great. Okay? You got it, my man. Hey, thank you. Thank you. Mm. I love his hairstyle. That's, yeah, the yeah. Be <laughs> that's the best thing I love about this guy. Well, uh, we used to be there. We used to be.